The Graphic Histories Podcast. I got bit by a radioactive bug. I tried experimental drugs. Went up for a stroll on a gamma testing range. I found an enchanted urucane. I made a serum that made me small. I modified the serum so it would make I me call. I got radioactive isotope in my Welcome to the Graphic Histories Podcast. My name is Andre Mayette, and I will be your host. Big thanks to Uka the Mock for our theme song, Superpowers. And big thanks to you, gentle listener, for tuning in once again to the show. Today we have Jason Liu on the show, who is a contributor to Marvel Comics, uh, illustrator, writer, comic artist who created the Pitiful Human Lizard, very interesting Canadian-centric hero. Um, that that kind of got him on the map and then led towards bigger and better things with Marvel Comics, doing a lot of work with Marvel Unlimited. So I was very lucky to have him on the show, and I'd like to thank David Cutler, former guest on the show and former roommate of mine, for making that introduction because uh, Jason was a really cool guy. Really great little conversation. I uh, I got to, uh, to to learn more about his process, uh, so, some interesting topics, learning about the, the only child, uh, child of immigrants sort of experience. Uh, you know, making Toronto a city, a lot of interesting things, uh, or not making it a city, <laughs> making the city of Toronto a character. Um, a lot of interesting stuff and a, a great conversation and uh, one that I think you're going to enjoy. So uh, tune in. But before we get to that, let's uh, catch up with me. So it's been a uh, a sad week. Um, we had to put down one of our cats on Monday, Presley, who was almost 19 years old. Uh, Jen had her since she was a kitten. When I met Jen, she was about two, I think, uh, two or three. So, uh, you know, she's been around the entirety of our relationship and for almost uh, 19 years. Um, fun, amazing little cat, a lot of spirit. Uh, definitely didn't take a lot of a lot of crap, didn't back down from people bigger than her, but, but was affectionate and sweet. And uh, has, has, you know, gotten old and, and the time, we the time was, it, it was her time. She was starting to, to lose faculties and, and it was sad, very sad, um, but we knew what had to happen, and, and we took a weekend to spoil her and, and uh, treat her as best we could, and, and then on Monday we had to take her in and have the uh, and have the needle. And, uh, you know, like anything, having a pet, when you have a pet, you know that this is the price that comes with having a pet, essentially, that um, the, I guess, as I recently said to Jen when we were just chatting about it, that this is the price that is paid when you care about something. You care about anything, you uh, you have to be sad because of them eventually when they leave. Um, not if they leave, you know, walk away, but if when they're gone. And, uh, yeah, so it was the same day I had this interview with Jason Liu. I didn't let him in on it because I didn't want to bring him down to the conversation, but I think I managed to muddle through and, uh, and have a good talk with Jason and uh, put that out of my mind. But uh, yeah, so we're just mourning our, our beloved little princess, uh, Presley, and, and um, you know, as best we can right now. We have the three cats are still here, and they're doing great. Klaatu, Lebowski, and Sheba are still running the halls and, uh, and causing trouble, but uh, unfortunately we've lost one of them. So it's it's been a struggle. I mean, anyone who's had a pet and, and lost a pet knows that it takes time to, uh, to mourn them properly and, and be able to move on a little bit. I mean, obviously you're never really going to move on. Their memories are always with you. Bit, big impact on your life, of course, but um yeah this is uh that's that's something that's happened and uh sadly it's uh it's just been a big big mark on me this past week so getting through it uh you know and and uh you know go, struggling through but another i guess lighter news i um in honor of the frankenstein play i was in in which i played the creature i got a tattoo today it's uh, i wanted to do like a little tribute for the the role that i played cuz i felt like it was important to me it was a big step for me and, and a dream come true to be able to put on that production to co-direct it and also be in it so i wanted a little something to remind me of it you know of the creature the part i played so i got a, a band around my uh below my calf kind of above my ankle to kind of look like my foot was sewed on so it's uh it's a line with staples going around the, the entire the leg and i think it looks really cool it turned out really well and I'm, I'm really happy with it um some added realism to the the look of the tattoo right now because it's quite red just because it was done this morning 
But that's enough about me and my uh, my tattoos and my <laughs> my deceased pets. Uh, it's time to to get to the show. So let's uh, tune in with my conversation with Jason Liu, a creator with Marvel Comics and a creator of the Pitiful Human Lizard and a bunch of cool projects down the pipeline. Uh, yeah, so here it is, my talk with Jason Liu. Let's do this. Oh, sure. No worries. <laughs> I just put, I, I'll edit it off if uh, this is just us chatting. But uh, okay. yeah, no, I, uh, it sounded like like crazy loud, like you were like uh, like in a, in a tin box or something. But it's better now, right? Oh, it sounds perfect. Yeah. Microphone. All right. <laughs> I'm all this to Amazon. <laughs> yeah. Great. Uh, that's good. I just had to do that, actually. My uh, my wife, um, I got a pair of like Beats by Dre headphones years ago that just died on me. Um, I've had them for a very long time. So um, I was like, ah, I'm going to have to get a new pair of micro headphones. And uh, so I ordered a new pair. And then when they came in, my wife's like, why did you buy new stuff for Christmas? And I was like, well, I like I just needed them. And she's like, well, I bought you a pair. Or I'm buying you a pair because I knew you, you know, your other ones are getting old. And uh, I'm like, ah, well, maybe I'll return these ones because they were just like skull candy ones. And she's going to get me like these really high end Sony ones. Ooh. So uh, I, I plugged in the Sony, the, the skull candy ones to see what they sound like because they're like a higher end version of those. And uh, they did not work. They were like, something was wrong with them. So I was like, perfect. I'll send them back. <laughs> I'll actually use the money I, I sent them back for to get a Yeti mic, which I want to get for this anyway. So now I, you know, I'll get them head, headphones in a, and a nice mic. So that works out. Yeah, okay. perfect. So how are you? How are things? Uh, yeah, pretty good. Just, you know, uh, like I, 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 I got over COVID, but, uh, I still have like a little bit of a cough here and there. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've never had a dry cough, which is great, but you know, residual it, besides that, just the cough. Uh, yeah. I mean, there would be times where like, I'd be sweating, but then it's, but I think it's because I, I was just overdressed <laughs> during the winter time yeah but it's, it's hard to say because yeah like um like earlier today like i, I went out biking into in downtown and uh did some errands and when i was indoors like i was i was sweating i was like oh is this a fever but then it's like because like i like i was sweating around my my wrists as well yeah. i was like oh geez like this is one <laughs> of those like long-term yeah covid things but then uh I, I think it was just I was yeah I was just overdressed I, I I wore too much yeah it's the worst when you have that like you have those symptoms like I had um you know how the, the horror stories they were saying about how the the vaccine can give you myocarditis uh it, it's it basically makes your heart uh, like it's like an infection sort of in your heart so um it, it, like a chest pain then well yeah basically heart attack symptoms is what it was Ooh, so geez. yeah what happened was um I. I just was like sweat in the middle of the night. I wake up, my pillow, my bed would be soaked. Like I'm just sweating like all through the night. Yes. And, uh, and I had no energy. Like I work out a lot and I was like, just exhausted, even do it like to get up in the morning and do cardio. I could barely get through that, which was no problem normally every morning and lifting weights. I just felt like I had no energy and just sort of shitty all day. So I went to the the doctor and, and that's what I had. So I had to stay in the hospital for a few days while I got sorted and, um, and then had to be on heart medication for a few weeks. Everything's back to normal now. It's okay. kind of, yeah, yeah, no, it's all good. But, uh, it's like now, now in the middle of the night, if I'm like, you know, overly hot, I wake up and there's a little bit of sweat. I'm like, Oh, is it just like, is it back? But it's just like, usually it's because I have too many blankets on or I'm always run hot anyway. So it's, it's generally, generally how it goes. So, so where are you? Uh, I, I, uh, went back to the gym yesterday mm -hmm. uh for for because i used to like go to the gym like two three times a week mm -hmm. uh but then i had hernia surgery oh. late july been recovering from that That's and rough. like not lifting anything and then after recovering from covid i was like all right like looked myself in the mirror i was like okay i'm i'm, I'm, I'm gonna go back to the gym mm -hmm. and today i'm i'm feeling sore because I, I did lots of like chest presses mm -hmm. so i do feel pain <laughs> and i think it's because of that and i'm most hoping likely it's not because of what you were talking no about. no 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 I, th <laughs> I think i think it's fun usually those things happen if you have that issue uh, right after you get the the vaccine like so uh, and that was a long a while ago now i think it was the first second dose second dose mm -hmm. um I had the booster and it didn't nothing nothing bothered me. The doctor said it'd be fine probably. So, um, but yeah, you you in Toronto? Is that where you are? I am. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm in Toronto. 
How's the weather up there unseasonably warm as well as it is here? It, it's, uh, I mean, it, it got cold today. It, it's like minus one degrees uh, before, up and down. Like you, you don't know if if you've dressed too warm or not. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, <laughs> like yeah. yeah. So I'm- like uh, a while ago, like I, 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 like right after, like two days after I recovered from COVID, I, I, I went and did some walking around Toronto, like, and the thing is, I, I, even when I was working on Pitiful Human Lizard, uh, I would take these long walks across the city. Uh, I, I, I probably did about like 20,000 steps mm-hmm. uh, in my walk. <laughs> and, 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 and like the, the weather just gradually like goes from like moderately like okay to like really chilly. Mm-hmm. Uh but yeah, like I, I was prepared. I had my Uniqlo, Uniqlo uh, long johns on nice, all the time as I was trekking around. Nice. Uh, yeah, I'm out in Nova Scotia, so the weather's kind of hard to to, uh, to pin, but it's been unseasonably warm the last few days. I think it's like, it was like 10 degrees today. It's supposed to be 12 tomorrow, I think. So. And, and you, you guys get a lot of snow there? I mean, you guys don't get that much snow. Not, I mean, about average, I'd say. You know, people think it's... Uh, it's funny because I have a friend who's from, from Ottawa and uh, he's lived living here for a while now, but continually he'll complain that it's cold or he'll complain about something. And I'll be like, well, that's living on the East coast. And he's like, he's like, it's like his parents live in Alberta. He's like, it's way colder there. It's like, even like Ontario, it's like colder than here or Ottawa where he's from. I'm like, yeah, I know. I think it's just an East coast thing to assume that we have it the worst. Cause we're, you know, so far out this way, but, but uh, generally, yeah, a decent amount, like usually doesn't really, really hit till like January, like late January. And it'll stick around. You know, it's only really a couple months of like a lot of snow. We'll get usually one big snowstorm and one or two a year. And that's about it. So mostly like windbreaker weather. <laughs> windbreaker. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I mean, like when you hit February, it's, you know, minus minus five, minus 10. You're probably the the wind coat, the winter coats. But to, it's just unseasonably warm this past few days. I guess that's global warming for you. But uh, yeah, yeah, it was cool the last little while. And then it's just sort of hit into uh, into into what it seems to be winter until we get these weird little weird little December uh sort of heat bursts, I guess. So cool. So uh yeah. where where did you where did you begin? Where where were you born? Uh yeah, so we're, we're doing this right sure. now. Right? We, yeah. Well I mean this this is all kind of part of it. I uh, I generally like we'll probably start it when we just start chatting because I find that interesting too. But uh I uh, I generally just let it roll and then just <laughs> kind of record a nice casual conversation. Uh, I, I should get used was... to this because, like, I, I remember like listening to the, like the Nerdist for like to just right. jump in, like. Ah, uh, yeah, I like to try to keep it more like a, a fun conversation. Like, I just, I just chat. Usually, talk about your life, but we go off on tangents. Whatever you want to talk about, um, it's it's pretty casual. I like I find it more interesting to know people on a casual level, like we're just having a conversation, than to just shoot you a million questions. Usually, organically, it comes through the talks. So. But uh, um, so yeah. yeah, I guess to go, go to, to, to take it from the the top, uh, yeah, I, I was I was born in uh, Brampton, Ontario, which is like outside of downtown Toronto, mm-hmm. you know, s- suburbia. Um, so you didn't make it super far. No, <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I, the, the funny thing is, we're right now, uh, I'm at my parents' place right now in Mississauga. Oh, wow. Uh, because my, my partner, she she's using our place to do uh, uh, a work meeting. She, she's got a work meeting around the same time. So okay. it's like we can't have work. Uh, we can't have video talks at the same time, um, especially in a Toronto condo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I'm in Mississauga right now uh, in, in the house where I was raised in. Uh, the oh, second cool. house that I uh, grew up in um where are your folks from sorry where are your folks from um yeah my 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 folks they're they're both from indonesia but Mm -hmm. they met each other in a a chinese restaurant in downtown toronto (laughs) Uh, and And they're both from indonesia they're they're both from indonesia yeah so was it like a just coincidentally wow okay that's really cool yeah i mean what what what, like back then um Especially like you know, like when we're talking like the seventies, early eighties. Especially like yeah, the, around that time, like like they would 
immigrants would just hang out with people that they would know or just mm-hmm. people uh you know from from the same their same origin mm-hmm. uh, country so yeah my my, my parents they, they uh, were actually like set up by mutual <laughs> friends of theirs oh okay at, at a at her birthday party, I think, and, and and this Chinese restaurant on Spadina and Dundas, uh, yeah, the heart of Chinatown. Um, <laughs> and, and, and it was funny because I I only found out about that like maybe eight years ago. Oh, really? And, and, Parents and sat like, you down and like, here's where you started. Kind of. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, like I, I knew that they. I, I knew they were uh, they were set up. They, they met each other at a at a at a party, but I didn't know it was in a Chinese restaurant in downtown Toronto, which <laughs> was kind of funny because, um, you know, like at that time I was I was working on the Pitiful Human Lizard, this mm. offbeat Canadian superhero series that I wrote and drew, all set in actual locations around the city. And it, it's funny. I think there was there was one slogan I used, uh, or I think it was part of a brand that I used uh, called "Made in Chinatown," uh, <laughs> yeah. because I, back then when I like growing up, like we like we would like it, to to get good Chinese food or just Asian food in general. Like mm-hmm. you you had to go to downtown Toronto because there was no good. Chinese food, like anywhere, like in the suburbs. Mm-hmm. Um, they had a yeah, monopoly on it in downtown. Fine. So yeah, like made in Chinatown. What was was a brand that I, I was like I, I held like very near and dear to my heart, and it added a new meaning to it when I found out my parents met each other in, <laughs> in Chinatown. So I was like, I was like, there you go. Like, oh, that's awesome. Loved so much. That's super cool. So yeah. was uh, was comics something you were always into growing up? Is that like a, a love of yours from the start? I mean, I always loved drawing when I was five years old, um, and at an early age, like a, like a, you know, like I would always check out um, the comic section in the Toronto Star, and especially uh, on on the Saturdays where you would see the the full color. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, me too. That's funny. It's it's funny. I talked to a lot of people on this show, and you don't hear a lot of folks mention like newspaper comics. Normally, it's like rack comics or or something like that that come across. But I remember as a kid, um, the Chronicle Herald, which is the the Halifax paper here in Nova Scotia, that was all around the world. They would or all around the province. They would have the the Stan Lee Spider Man strips, and uh, I remember the the full color ones. That. Yeah, the full color ones yeah, that, that come out on Saturday. That had like Daredevil's origin story, I think, was one of them that was running. And I remember reading them and loving them so much. Um, and that was sort of something for me, too. But, yeah, I never hear people mention uh, newspaper strips, which is a rarity. But... <laughs> not, not these days, no. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> yeah, certainly not. Certainly not today. I don't think no, the, no, the creators of tomorrow will be uh, killed. <laughs> In this economy, no. Um, but, yeah, during those times, like, yeah, uh, there would always be like one or two action uh, comic strips. So there was like Terry and the Pirates, mm-hmm. uh, ter- no Terry and the, the Pirates, mm-hmm. or Spider Man was one of those things that came in occasionally, which I thought was really cool, and I would follow that, hoping like waiting for it to to come back the next Saturday, and then it, it was only there for like four Saturdays, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. and, and it was like it was like rotated with something else, but yeah, like that medium. Like to, to tell like a story from beginning to end in a comic strip, like a joke or just this one action sequence was like, this is doable. This is something that I can do. I like and and especially seeing a show like Caroline in the City. Oh <laughs> man, that's another thing that like it's funny. I love this because there's things that come up that I grew up watching that nobody ever really references, and that was another one too. That's hilarious. Yeah, well, when I saw something like that happen, where like Leah Thompson making a living in New York as a cartoonist, mm-hmm. seeing you know like like her her studio apartment and be like that that's how I want to live my life. Like I want to <laughs> like make make a living just just working on comics, 
and yeah that and 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 that's where i, I kind of got the idea of like of like how much backlog of comics you need to do so mm. at like maybe one of my one of like five and six you you figured this out that you like you need no, to have I, a backlog that was when i was like 11, 10 or 11 years okay. old okay i was gonna say um, you're, you're real advanced but 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 before that like like i i, I was like making little booklets mm-hmm. uh of drawings when i when i discovered the stapler and we, <laughs> we had our own stapler so i was like all right i'm just gonna do all these drawings i'm stapling it's a book it's a yep. book <laughs> but that, that, so that was like so so that happened first and then caroline in the city and learning how to make comic strips and then making my own little uh characters um and like it's just like three panel comic strips or, or five panel comic strips. I would just be in my room, just drawing away and then putting them in a, a uh, self-addressed envelope because that's how you copyright your material. I remember hearing that as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Do you ever remember uh, the Jim Henson show? It was called Dog City. Um, it was about a cartoonist. It was he. He was. He was a, a puppet and he, they were all dogs. Um, then he lived in an apartment building and he would draw a cart, a comic book or a cartoon about a dog detective and the cartoon in him would talk and the show would like, that was another one for me that you said, I don't know if it was, it was Jim Henson, but it was some kind of a kid show. The, the cartoon dog, like, like was like that cartoon dog was like a private eye. Right? Yeah. Ace. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And that, I think, I think cool. Elliot was the, uh, Elliot was the name of the animator. It's one of those things that always pops up in my head is, and everybody, all the characters on the cartoon were people in his building. Like he would like the mobster was like his, his landlord. They're all sort of based on people. They're around all inspired. Of yeah. Course. Yeah. I remember yeah, that show a lot. When you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah, that, 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 kind of came into play later on in, in, in my comic career too. But uh, like another show um, that also, I also found fascinating was uh, a, a show with Bob Newhart. Oh yeah. And the you one that Ty Templeton about? worked, the one that Ty Templeton worked on. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what was it called? Mad Dog. Yeah. I mean, that, that was the character. That yeah. Was Cause there was a, there was a comic that came out that had, that were flipped. One was like the old version and one was the newer ver- revamp version from the series. So it, what was the name of that show? It only lasted for like a season or like half a season or something. It, it, you know what? It, it might've been the Newhart show. Maybe. I don't think it was um, Bob Newhart comic comic show. I'm going to have to Google this because I remember a buddy of mine brought it up to me and I remember talking about it. Um, uh, it'll, Come yeah, to I me. love that Ty Templeton art. Yeah, I think I talked to Ty. I never had time to show. I wanted to, um, and I talked to him, but he, uh, he was, you know, he was, he was rather ill at the time. I, I think he's doing better now, which is good to hear. Yeah. But, uh, um, yeah, I, uh, I would love to to chat with him about that. I think I see him at a show one time, and he might have had a copy of it on his table, and we we're talking about it. Or nice. I was just talking to him at a con. I, I had a little indie comic I made that I gave him, and we had a long conversation about it one time. Oh, it was called Bob. You're right. It's <laughs> something it, like that. It's yeah, Bob. It was like okay, it's Bob. just Bob. Yeah, yeah, 92 it came out. It had two seasons. Wow, 33 episodes. Yeah, I I, I looked into that and I think it was like uh there, there was like a, it ended with a cliffhanger or something like that or, oh, or one uh, of those. Yeah. The worst when shows do that. <laughs> like I I was sitting as a kid I sat on Twin Peaks for like so I remember watching it when I was like as a t- teenager, and I was watching reruns of it. When it got to the end, I was so disappointed that it was a cliffhanger that never got resolved. And now, twenty five years later, we finally get it. But uh, <laughs> you know, so I guess never give up hope. But uh, yeah, but I don't think Bob's coming back anytime soon. No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was he was like an old old timey cartoonist, right? And then there was like a, his character was getting revived, but to be new and hip or something, and he had to like play, like work with some young artist to like for this new show or something I, oh, around the same time as like image comics when when they were booming with uh, mm-hmm. rob liefeld and, and jim lee that that whole artist movement it's funny yeah. that, that that was so big like because comics always seem outside of the normal realm of like you know pop culture i mean not, not so much anymore now that we have marvel movies and all that sort of stuff but there's a time period where it was just so far removed from feeling like it was anywhere close to what was so like the public eye or what was what was popular in, in culture 
So like even that like that that just speaks to how big Image Comics was and how big of a ripple that was that like it even bled into like TV shows with like Bob Newhart and people that were known. Like super interesting. Liefeld was making Levi's jeans commercials. Yeah, I forgot about that. Crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like it's a bunch of like hip rock star like comic book people and uh it's um it really like, were. Yeah, it, it really was. It's like that weird, like, punk sort of mentality kind of brought to comics, too, which is very interesting. Um, especially considering, like, when you looked at, like, I mean, there were people before them, like, I, I would count Neil Gaiman and, and, like, Alan Moore and Grant Morrison and sort of the precursors to that. But, like, to to get to that 90s where all these, like, the, the new hip, like, you know, they're all, like, they're all wearing leather jackets and they're so cool looking and they, like, walking out of Marvel and starting their own thing and it's popular. It was just such a, such a, an event. I don't know. Well, yeah, it, it was, it was, like, the NWO. Mm-hmm. That's what it was. Like, they were all working on hot titles. Yeah. Uh, they were, like, they were working on Spider-Man, X-Men. They, like, they were, like, well planted. And then they were, like, all right, we're, uh, we're done working on these because we, we, we want to do stuff uh with you their get, own credit yeah and, and get paid for it well you know exactly they own the things we create yeah and, and that became nwo comics <laughs> <laughs> well i'm uh I, I i'm a professional wrestler as well i'm not sure if dave told you anything about me but uh no way <laughs> yeah so uh those references deeply uh resonate with me that's for sure so i, I wonder uh yeah who would be the hulk hogan <laughs> oh, uh, like, uh, why? no, no, that, that no, would be it'd be McFarland. It'd have to be yeah, McFarland. Yeah, uh, for sure. And then Jim Lee would be the Kevin Nash because he's been like this steadfast. Yeah, for sure. Just very reliable. Like he, he's he's never. I mean, yeah, yeah, he's always been there, right? I guess Liefeld would be the Scott Hall, I suppose. <laughs> I guess you know, like yeah. <laughs> he did kind of jump around a little, you know, move about exactly. and to and fro and. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like he's got all his eggs in the Deadpool basket right now because that's pretty popular with the uh, with the new movies and stuff. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. cool. So uh, you're drawing comics. What were you? What What was your strip? What were you drawing? Um, it it, it was about this uh, failed assassin. Um, his name was Amos. I like uh, it. And I, I and I think it might, might might have just been inspired by like Nicolas Cage made a movie of. I think it was like Amos and Andy or Amos and Andrew or something like that. I think it was like Nicholas Cage and Samuel L. Jackson. And I thought like Amos was just a funny name. And, <laughs> and, I, and I thought like Amos and aim uh, and, and ammo, like th- that, that just works oh, yeah. for an assassin. Like, yeah. Genius for, for <laughs> an 11 year old to come up with a. That's right. That's actually like fairly that. deep for an 11 year old's uh, thought process. Yeah. 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 Uh, and this was a character that I, I later brought into uh, another comic that I did. Of, uh, well, when I started doing mini comics, so that that's when I grew out of doing comic strips. So when when I was in high school, like when I uh, when I was fourteen, a friend of mine uh, who I grew up with, he went to art school. He would format the pages before sending him over to uh staples well it was not staples at the time it was a business depot but there was a printing depot and, and he would go there and, and make his copies and i was like that that's genius you know i i got some characters lined up already i, I should make my own comics and that's what i did it in my respective high school and i made some comics um, and, and sold them to my friends at the school cafeteria, uh, as well as uh, became friends with uh, people that played in bands. So if they had a gig, uh, I would be at their merch table and and uh, well, that's pretty clever. Sold my comics there, and it eventually grew into yeah, uh, like uh, 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 I'll, I'll just keep at it and, and like. I'd gradually learn something new, um, uh, uh, whether it was technique or just oh hey, like I, I think I, I I have like well I, I uh, especially since I I, I was working part time, I was able to afford doing like 
colored covers. Ooh. Oh, wow. <laughs> Black and white <laughs> covers throughout. Uh, just to make it look a bit more snazzy. Um, yeah, in, in college, I, I studied in, I, I studied in uh, Sheridan College in Oakville for uh, mm-hmm. illustration. And uh, I, I learned all sorts of techniques uh, in, throughout their programs, like in, in their mixed media uh mixed yeah media course their uh life drawing courses their their um pa- their painting courses and then and i would corp- incorporate some of that into the comic that i worked on which was um the early incarnation of of, of pitiful human lizard it was just called human lizard saves a day <laughs> and a great title. It, it was uh human li- uh- the human lizard was a character that i I, that was inspired by James Robinson's Starman. Oh, wow. Because I, I thought it was fascinating to see a second generation superhero and, and, and have their own take on, on the mantle that they're carrying. Um, so, yeah, like I, I, I worked on this, this working class, this, this, this guy that works in an office but doesn't have a big budget. Uh, I mean, doesn't like, you know, he, he doesn't have like the, the resources like Bruce Wayne or Tony Stark. Um, so, you know, his, his costume is pretty shabby and the same with his skills and all, because he, he's trying his best at everything. Like mm-hmm. trying to do well at his job, but uh, as well as being a good person as a superhero. That's a fundamentally um, Canadian idea for a superhero. Well, like someone that's just uh you know, trying literally just trying his best. Like if that's like your tagline, just trying my best. Trying you know? his best. <laughs> yeah, which is great. I love it. it. It's such a down to earth but fun sort of take on it. Like you, you can always do the dark and gritty real life stories, which are great, and there's lots of them. But I love the idea that just like the daily grind stories of like uh, of uh, what the day to day life of like a dude who doesn't have a lot of money. It's kind of like Spider the old Spider Man comics, and why I love them too. Trying to you know try every day. He's like just doesn't have enough money to pay for. Aunt May's heart medication. He's trying to go to school, and you know, he's it's just that sort of stuff I find interesting and always a fun little fun little way to take the story. Yeah, he, he he's like Spider Man, but the, the spectacular. You take out the amazing. You take out even a Mary Jane because <laughs> he, 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 he's also struggling with his dating life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, very just bare bones, just an average guy that's doing his best to be a superhero. Was the pitiful human lizard an analog for Jason Liu? I think it evolved closer to me uh, as I got older with the series, especially mm-hmm. when when I uh, when I began working on it again as Pitiful Human Lizard mm-hmm. uh, in 2014. Uh, Is that when you start working with Chapter House? Yeah, like I worked with Chapter House about maybe a year or two into the series. Oh, okay. Uh, but but before chapter hosts, it, it was all it, it started with Kickstarter, and then and then I uh, yeah I, I was just taking all the profits from like the early from, from like the first issue to make the the second issue, and then it just cycled on from there. How I never really talked to anybody that really got their start through Kickstarter. How did that be? Like how how did that go for you as far as trying to get a, an original character out through a through a Kickstarter? Uh, like what year would this been? Two thousand and 2014 okay uh and 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 it was it was pretty scary because (laughs) it was was at a time where i was uh you know this is 2014 this is 10 years after i graduated from sheridan college yeah i was gonna ask you how would your how did your folks feel when you said you're going into illustration animation Oh, uh, okay. So that's another story. Because um, <laughs> it's, it's rare that it's positive. Every once in a while, someone's like, "Oh yeah, my parents are super supportive." I'm like, "Oh, oh, okay." <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's. Um, I mean, you know, like just like a, like every Asian parent, um, like mm. especially my dad. My dad wanted me. Like I, I'll just like collect like my conversations with my dad throughout the years, where he would just ask me, "Hey, like." what do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, I want to be a cartoonist. Are you sure you don't want to be a doctor? No, I'm, I'm a cartoonist. 
uh, next year after that, who would ask me the same thing? And, and then it's like, uh, did it change yet? Did it change? Well, yeah. Well, yeah. like we would, there would be uh, this like this operation program that's on TV, and he and he'd be like, you know, if you're able to see blood, you're you're able to be a doctor. It's like, no, no, I'm I'm dead set. I don't want to be an artist. It's like, then, uh, you know, years after that, same thing. And then to the point where like. That, 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 that's when he starts to become he uh he starts to become supportive by uh yeah he realized you know, he couldn't turn he you sees anything on art in in the toronto story he'd be like hey jason this is something about art you would you want to read this it's like sure okay it's not oh. the, the art that i'm into but that cool that's that's kind of neat well that's really sweet um, actually it's nice that he turned it into uh into support after realizing that perhaps his you, you just weren't cut out for what his his dream was for you yeah, but um, you know, it, it, it was still kind of rough. Like uh, after I graduated from Sheridan, because uh, you know, like I, I would only do some, I would, I would have like a few illustration gigs here and there. Like I, I did this one graphic novel, educational graphic novel for Scholastic, and and, and I, I and that's when I, I found out that um, they don't pay as much. As the American publishing world were, were like, like they thought, you know, people would be paid across the board. Mm. Whereas like, Ooh, like if I'm putting like so much work into this and only getting paid this much, like, I don't know if I can like, like 2004, I don't know if I can even afford to like rent a place on my own. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it was kind of discouraging, but I, I, I at least I, ha- I, I, uh, I, had a steady job at a library uh, mm-hmm. since high school, and I and I've I've, I've you know s- slowly developed my role in the library while I was a cartoonist, oh, cool. and, and that's what uh, reassured my 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 mom and my my dad that well you know at least he has a steady job yeah so that way he and, and he can pursue his his you know his hobbies yeah yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, 20, 2014 was like uh, when I brought back to Piddle for Human Lizard. This was like after, like years after failures of like going to conventions, creating like all these different creator own mini comics, and like you know, like not getting the turnout that I want um, to the point where it's like it, it's just very demoralizing or just you know just very uh i just feel i just felt very defeated Mm. where by 2014 i was like okay well i i I got back into uh reading marvel comics after the marvel films and just going back into like um the silver age and the bronze age stuff just the stuff that i i fell in love with when i was a kid and like to 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 see why they were successful and, uh, and, and, and be like, you know, like they made New York as a character in the comic. Like we've never seen Toronto as a, as a character uh, in a comic book before. And, and, and I wanted to do the same thing. And I was like, so, so I, I pretty much like took everything I've learned from my failures of, of those 10 years of, of, you know, post college as well as everything I've learned from, um, from college, uh, from my internship with, with Raid Studios, with Chip Zdarsky, from my, my short apprenticeship with Larry Hama, who, like, he was such a harsh critic at the <laughs> uh, I, I heard that from other people that have worked with Larry. I wanted, who is it? Was it Sutton? Or no, um. Uh, Je- Jeff Urshawood, I remember he was telling me about that. Uh, Larry was uh, uh, a harsh, harsh critic, uh, but also uh, a rewarding, a rewarding person to spend time with. How yeah. did the, how did the raid studio and that happen? And the uh, and uh, the the um, so the raid? raid studios um, two thousand and four. Well, it was uh, my third year in in, uh, in in Sheridan College, and we uh, we had to do internship and. Um, I was in contact with Kagan McLeod, uh, before, before I went to Sheridan because, 
Kagan McLeod, who we all now know his work from the end credits of She-Hulk. Mm. But before then, like, I remember like seeing his name and his work in a wizard magazine and seeing that it was mentioned that he graduated from Sheridan college. Mm -hmm. And I reached out to him out of the blue before going into Sheridan's like, Hey, Kagan, like my name is Jason. I also want to be a comic artist. And I, uh, and, and it's cool that, that you're, you're going that, that you're Sheridan grad. Cause I'm planning on going to Sheridan and, and, uh, and yeah, he, and, so I reached out to him again and yeah, he was, he was, he, he took me under his wing um, and he was working on infinite Kung Fu at the time. So I got to see his process and he was, a sh- and he was sharing a studio with uh, Cameron Stewart, who at the time was working on Sea Guy. I was going to say Sea Guy. Yeah. And- I'm, I'm a huge Great Morrison fan. So I'm very familiar. Yeah. So he was working yeah. on that. Uh, he, and he was, uh, he also shared a studio with Ben Shannon and he also shared, uh, yeah, Ben Shannon, who it, uh, was an in-house illustrator for the national post along with Steve Murray, AKA Chip Zdarsky at mm. the time. And, uh, Steve Murray, AKA Chip mm. Shannon, um, th- they, uh, at the time they, they had, they were doing this illustration work for uh, this educational publisher where they had to do about like 50 illustrations per book on a certain subject like bullying or peer pressure or drugs or whatever. <laughs> so I was busy doing like color flats hmm. uh, for, for their illustration. So that was like my first early collaboration with, with Chip Zdarsky wow. uh, was like just doing color flats, learning like all these shortcuts uh, on Photoshop, uh, like the whole process behind yeah Photoshop and post pre-production, post-production of, of making comics. Um, and after I graduated from Sheridan, Chip would actually for me, jobs that he wouldn't want but you know there were jobs that i I was handed down to and Mm -hmm. and there were some of my early work so like i can and that's when i continued to do more work for these educational publishers oh i see okay so it worked out too there oh very cool yeah so yeah that, that, that that was how i built my uh relationship with 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 chip and and kagan um and then, but Larry was, uh, Larry Hama was, um, how that started. I, uh, I was, okay. So, uh, growing up, I was, I was a huge GI Joe fan and then went back into the whole GI Joe hobby through college, um, and going on these message boards and became friends with someone who happens to know Larry Hama, like happens to be good friends with them. And I was doing, some freelance illustration work for this this guy uh from the message board and my my payment was uh to have one-on-one conversations with Larry Hammer. so I would show him my work and <laughs> like a writer for for Wolverine like the the the, the godfather of, of G.I. Joe like mm-hmm. He like I'm I'm hoping that he's gonna like say good things about my work, but like it was complete opposite because <laughs> I, I learned the hard way that you don't go anywhere with compliments. Like no. if you want to grow as an artist, like you got to know uh, all the things that you're doing wrong and and try to grow from that, and also learn that like every uh, new comic that uh, like. The, the last comic you worked on should not be something that you should be praising, that, that should be cherishing. You, you should always look at your next work as your next best work. But yeah, Larry Hammond was, was someone who almost made me want to quit comics. It took me about three days after to like turn around, you know, like, uh, 
my, like <laughs> just just forget the ego that I had and be like, yeah, you you know, like yeah, you're totally right. Uh, one thing that Larry Hammond said, <laughs> and and what was he asked me, did he ever go to art school? I was like, yeah, I graduated from Sheridan. Does it look like it? <laughs> it's like, and it took me a while for me to to figure. I was like, yeah, you know what? Like, you're totally right because like I did, well, you know, I, I I did like studying life drawing and and. and life painting and all that stuff, object drawing, but I've never applied that in a comic panel, in each mm-hmm. comic panel. Like I realize how much work that needs to go in each comic panel. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, like, like, and, and there's a whole grind to it. Like he, he says, like you have to do a thousand crappy drawings to get one that you like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> No, to, to, no to, to get like a really decent one. Mm-hmm. Funny thing was, uh, like, w- like one of the things that I showed him was, uh, was a 100, it, it was a, like, it was at least a 90 page graphic novel that I wrote and drew, uh, about these keen spies and which he, he took apart. And then it took me like a week for me to like recover from that to the point where like, I'm going to like, redo every single <laughs> page after learning from from everything that uh that that uh we talked about what with, with like what larry told me about and uh that that i need to work on and yeah like i, I just just hustle just 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 grind it away on on redrawing those 90 pages uh after like all 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 the lessons on on like you know like just just being inspired by old cinema especially like uh you know spaghetti western films like sergio leone Mm -hmm. uh like speaking my language now yeah i mean you you are this entire time i feel like you and i have a lot in common but they uh yeah like uh, it's it's somebody else i spoke to recently talked about using um oh it was um kurosawa was another inspiration oh uh, excellent well um it was um uh jim rugg talked about that using uh using wrestling as a way of uh of uh, to to frame action when he's right drawing comics and i remember finding that interesting that you don't hear about a lot of people talking about like wrestling or film when using it as reference so much for some of their, uh, it, but it makes perfect sense because film is storyboards. Like like literally you look at a, a frame of a movie, it's, it's a frame of a comic and that's what a storyboard is. So it's a, uh, it, it makes a lot of sense that the two would transition. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and like when, when you, when you study these films, like you, you, you have to dissect, like how does this mood work? Like, how, like the, the mood that they convey like like just break it down like why does it work and then mm. and try to like translate that into a comic strip uh, or a comic page um so yeah that, that's where i i did lots of digging into like learning the right panels the right angles uh, to tell a story what was mainly through through those lessons um so yeah, like everything that Larry taught me, everything I learned from Ray, everything from from college, um, I took that all that knowledge into Pitiful Human Lizard, Lizard, and because this was the comic strip that was, I mean, this was the comic series. Well, not the comic series; it was the comic book that was going to make or break. It was like this is going to be my one shot into like getting back into comics again. Mm-hmm. And if, if, if it fails where, well, at least I did a 52 page comic book about a Toronto superhero and a 50, you know, 52 pages would be substantial enough for people to, to get enough of the, the, the mood, the, the action, uh, uh, the, enough of the impression of the, the, the character that I introduced to the city. Um, and, and thankfully, uh, when I, when I rolled out Kickstarter, 
uh, a lot of people were excited to see a Toronto superhero because there never really was a Toronto superhero. Uh, not in, 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 in the way that I, like I framed it of, of like, you know, um, yeah, like celebrating the city of like every, like every angle I used was thought out because it's, it's an actual shot of Toronto. It's not like, I'm copping out by drawing these generic buildings and then putting the CN Tower in the background. Like, mm-hmm. no, like every neighborhood in Toronto is a character. Um, there is, um, there is certain styles to these buildings, so people can recognize where the where a, a very pedestrian superhero like the the human lizard would be trekking around during his, his adventures. Like it, be walking down Parkdale and then the next scene he's in the downtown CN Tower core, which would be like a 30 minute mm-hmm. street car ride. Like, like it has to be very feasible. So like, so this was, yeah, a, a lot of thought went into the, uh, betraying yeah. the city of Toronto. The city and, as a character itself. Yeah, that's really that's really cool. Um, do do you feel like that was the the bulk of the the support was from people like Toronto people, um, uh, like that are recognizing that the city itself, or is it like just people excited to have a Canadian in general superhero that that a lot of attention has been spent for? Or do you think it's more regional, like to Toronto? There's two hooks. The, yeah. Okay, so the first hook is oh, it's a Toronto superhero. It's mm-hmm. it's cool that it's set in Toronto. Awesome. But then when they get to know the actual character. This character, Lucas Spirit, the human lizard, he is a Torontonian. He he is us. Like mm. a lot of people can relate to him. He he is this very modest, humble, very apologetic Canadian. Uh, <laughs> and, and and people can gravitate or relate to him or or relate to his supporting cast of characters. Cause I because I wanted to also portray the the multiculturalism of, of the city as well as by by putting that into these token characters like they also have their own arcs uh, mm. in his story where we're, you know it, it's kind of like Neil Gaiman and Sandman where like you, you come for a human lizard but you find out that his like his other characters, the support of the other characters are, are much more interesting than mm-hmm. the protagonist himself. Um, so yeah, that, that was the hook. What was was capturing also the attitudes and behaviors that um, that best represent everyone of Toronto. Wow, well, that's really cool. So then you get hooked up with Chapter House, and they kind of fold him into the universe they're building with. Uh, Captain Canuck and uh, and the other characters, Northgard and those guys. Yeah, and and I, and I wanted to, and and this was so twenty fourteen was around the time of like the, the Canadian superhero renaissance of like mm. the return of Captain Canuck and, and Northgard and uh, and even like Nelvana of, of mm-hmm. the Northern Lights. Uh, there was a bunch of like Kickstarters going around about like you know like a. a reprints of these golden age Canadian yep. superheroes. And I wanted to make sure that my superhero was not going to be like a stereotypical Canadian mascot, like a, a stereotype. Like I, I didn't want him to Just be Captain like, America, but for Canada, that's what most of them are. Yeah. 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 Like, like I, I didn't want to betray him uh, as Canadian by his costume. It had to be by like, like who he is, like how he acts with with everyone yeah. else, with his own um, identity, but just happens to be Canadian. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, that's much, much a much fresher take on it than just you know being screamingly patriotic. And and it also would feel universal for other people because when. Uh, Especially when, when Chapter House started picking it up, and and they uh, they really helped with the master distribution. You know, having this comic be distributed as far as Australia, 
Like I, I remember when, when I was doing my first signing for the Pitiful Human Lizard under Chapter House at a, at Silver Snail, which uh, uh, is, is one of the comic institutions of, of our city. Yes, I've been um, there. It was it was like a mecca for me when I got there. I was very very excited. Yeah. yeah. So like when, when I was doing the signing, and, and like uh, George, the manager at the time, like he he was going down social media. Uh, about pitiful human lizard and and he was like going like dude like someone's tweeting about pitiful human lizard in australia it's like <laughs> crazy like that's how far that this book has gone that's awesome i, I, I one time i was in new york in 2016 or yeah 2016 and you know just just walking down Times Square and hearing Drake and The Weeknd being played in, in storefronts and then going to Midtown Comics and then seeing my comic actually like on the racks, like like face wow. front. And and this one clerk, uh, he came by and, and he, he came by and he, he was, he didn't know who I was at the time. And he was like, uh, he, he was plugging his comics, his comic on, on the shelf and, and i was like oh that's that's kind of cool uh by the way you should check out my comics like which one is yours and it's like oh it's the pitiful human lizard it's the one that says like new on the shelf and it's like dude that's yours like yeah like dude like we had to like reorder yeah, awesome. <laughs> these these comics because like these are flying off the shelf and it's like really it's like hey could you like sign all of our copies like yeah for <laughs> sure and that's when i when i felt like i made it like in new york with with a, a title like the human lizard uh oh that's lovely yeah <laughs> that's really awesome it's a, it'd be so, so surreal to be in the, i imagine like getting to the level of success where you're seeing your stuff in books in places like that like midtown and and uh you know all that sort of stuff would be so surreal that's amazing i, I remember uh like friends uh, like on the internet would even like like i remember seeing like a photo of of my comic in forbidden planet in the uk uh and, and even like the first issue was carried in, in meltdown comics in in uh and I'm like wow like this is crazy like meltdown comics could like and you know especially like me being a used to be like an avid listener of, of the Nerdist podcast, knowing mm. that that's where they recorded their podcasts. Like, mm. oh, I thought that was so cool. That's awesome. Very, very cool. So when, when does, uh, when does Marvel and, and the rest of the stuff come, come to the table? I work. So after working on pitiful human lizard for five years, um, and that had a did that have a like a, a, a is that an end is it over of the it of, did have an end yeah um it. yeah like I read a bit of it but I never read uh, I haven't got all of it yet so I have to I have to make sure to finish that up I also noticed that they're uh, they're listed as seasons when you put out the the trade paperbacks was that a yeah, a decision on your part or very no that it was not my idea oh really no it was not I'm gonna no, say no. were you angling this for a TV show at the start or a movie of some kind. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> uh, let, let, let's start with the. Uh, uh, well, I mean, okay. So yeah, yeah the pitiful human lizard went on for five years mm -hmm. uh, under chat. Uh, uh, I, I did about like twenty-two issues, twenty-one wish issues with Chapter House, um, and because of like. Uh, I was just really not happy with like how they were running things. Cause like they were, it, it was very promising at the start, but then I, I, down the road, um, you know, like just there were like late payments. They were like, the books were being released late. No. Like my work was, was, was done. And it was, it was uh, you know, so to like you know explain to to comic readers like hey when's the next issue coming out like and they would yeah like, and you know like I showed the fans like you know uh because I, I would do these these like ink like penciling marathons inking marathons for each issue mm -hmm. where I would do you know like twenty pages in in seven days or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. Like that insane amount, like short amount of time, and like just spread them all out. 
uh, for, for everyone to see. The work's done. Like, look at this. But also, I, I think I made a world record, too. Mm -hmm. uh, and... But yeah, because of the delays, uh, and and also like the, the last four issues through Chapter House, they were only available online. Mm. So like all the work that I put into like like writing and drawing, and and coloring, lettering, and and I would not get any page rates for this. I I right. depended on on the revenues, the, the dividends. Mm. Uh, I, I had no clue on on the sales for the online, mm -hmm. uh, or, or or like did you know they, they would hardly promote these comics yeah. that, that were available. So I, I was like, all right, well, you know, my, my contract here is done with them, anyways. I I think I did more of of what I was expected to do with for Chapter House. It, 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 like I, I was only I only had a two year contract, but I was with them for like four years i gave them no. four years of work wow 21 issues and i was like okay you know what a lot of uh, some of the fans that would stop at my table wondering what's like what's new what like what's happening with the, the, the human lizard mm -hmm. uh, i decided to like you know take my rights back you know I even went through a lawyer just to make sure that like i rightfully so retain these rights to mm -hmm. to continue making to, to continue working on the Pitophium Lizard. Uh, so I worked on the very last issue in uh, 2019, and it was called Pitiful Human Lizard, Some Heart Left. And it was just oh, uh, a 32-page uh, comic where it, it, if this was your first Pitiful Human Lizard comic, like, it you would still get it like you, you would you would still understand the struggles that this character still goes through in his fifth year because mm -hmm. this was like the fifth year celebrating the series and, and the final issue so after that uh, like i was i was uh you know um i i, I was uh i was very down uh mm. Yeah, I mean, I can understand why you have your character sort of be misrepresented, not misrepresented, but like, you know, mishandled, mishandled in a way that, yeah, mishandled in a way that would, would certainly make you feel uh, dejected, I would say, uh, especially trying to work with a, a publisher and trying to go, you know, mainstream, as, as mainstream as you can get at, with the, you know, the assets you have available to you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, like, like the, 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 the Jack kirby quote like comics will break your heart like that mm. really resonated with me it, it, it took me it, a very long time to even work on that very last issue because you know i went from working 20 pages in seven days to like one page a week mm. uh like i i, I was just that um disheartened that like just that um yeah, I, I, I just I just felt very hurt, just heartbroken about the whole yeah. industry of, um, and I, and I was like, okay, well, this is the end. But then I I got this email from Chip, uh, asking me, hey, would you want to be the, an artist for my new project? And you know, like I, I've been following Chip with his 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 you know Marvel work at the time, like he was working on Howard the Duck and. And yeah. Star Lord, and he was also supporting the Pitiful Human Lizard, and like he, he, uh, he, he saw potential in me, and he was like, he, he, he really helped put a spotlight on me, and he was like, yeah, like, he, like he, 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 he needs an artist for his new project, but the only catch was, uh, I'm gonna, I'm expected to draw lots of cars. And I was like, well, I'll do anything. I mean, this is this is a great opportunity. And, and especially knowing that it's going to go through Comixology Originals, which is this brand new uh, initiative through Comixology where it's curated titles. And he worked out a budget where I was going to get paid well in comparison to Pitiful for Human Lizard. I got like a page rate. I was like, wow, like a very... 
very, uh, it, it was a very substantial page rate where, oh, uh, where I was like, wow, like this, this is, this is like the big leagues to me. Actually, it, like I look at the page rate in comparison, like to, to like my Marvel page rate. And it's like, they're, they're <laughs> neck and neck. Really? Wow. And uh, yeah, you know, Jeff Bezos money, right? Yeah. So right. Yeah. I was like, well, go, go to space that, next. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I uh, like knowing that a lot of eyes are going to be on this project. A lot of eyes, like a lot of fans of Chip, are going to be looking at this new thing that Chip is going to be working on. It's like I got to throw my A game now because, like, so I, I I even worked harder uh, for this series and the series that we worked on together is called Afterlift, which was, uh, is about, uh, a ride share driver who, uh, gets held hostage by the devil, uh, who has to take, uh, who, who's using her service to, to transport souls to hell. And it, cool it, idea. It's, it's a very universal, it, it's a story that has a very universal message about how, you know, people who make life decisions and, and who the people who don't think they're good enough are, are probably the ones that might be good to go to heaven. And the, the people who are, are, are thinking highly of themselves are, are definitely not good enough to go to heaven. That's usually, that's usually my experience when it comes to the hyper elite religious people is usually they're, they're so self sanctioned sanctified that sanctimonious that, you know, they think that their actions are, are, you know, justified in some weird way. And that the yeah. people, yeah, the people that second guess themselves or worry about what this is, how this is going to affect others are the ones that actually probably would, would deserve to go to a, an afterlife if, if one such exists. And, and the afterlife that, that we created in this series, uh, this mini series. Uh, That's a great idea. I'm really high in that. I didn't know about the series, so I have to look it up. Yeah, we, we, we amalgamated so many different beliefs. It, so it's not just Christianity. Uh, like we, we, we wanted to try to express that like everyone's belief is right. Like, mm. like the end goal is, 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 uh, is very common um so yeah we, we had to like a, a, as a co-creator i had to like brainstorm like visually like how these ideas would look in, in our book um and yeah like so chip was writing it i was drawing it um i i, I came up with the concepts of these characters actually he, he would at the start he, he would give me like this this a short paragraph of, of the premise. And then I just went ahead drawing all these casts of characters, uh, like characters that I think would look cool for, for the comic strip, uh, for, for the comic series, especially like drawing these little scenarios. And, you know, it, it would give chips some ideas of, well, I, I could fit this, this in. Uh, so it was, a, it was a collaboration that way where like he would feed on like what I would love to draw, uh, mm. as well as you know, uh, his idea, and, and fuse it together, and and uh, yeah, this, this comic series, uh, this mini series that we uh, did for Comicsology, uh, won us an award, uh, won us an Eisner Award uh, in twenty twenty, and and as well as a Joe Schuster award. And, and that's when doors started to open mm. um, where, where, where people started to take notice. But I, but I, I think for, I, I, I'm a huge multiple man fan. Mm -hmm. So I, I did this comic sample. Of, so uh, before you continue, what, what drew you to multiple man of all the, like the, the X-Men, why was multiple man your, 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 uh, your go-to Maddox? Yeah. Uh, Madrox. Uh, or Madrox, yeah, he, right? He he he's a character that I, I I I've I've connected since I was like eleven or twelve years old. Like what with you, the the nineties X Factor. Yeah. Um, mainly because I'm an only child, 
Mm-hmm. He's an only child and seeing like, just, just like how he goes through entertaining himself. Uh, <laughs> by by he, making copies of himself to play with? Copies of himself. Th- th- there was this one scene that resonated and this was like one he like after he died from the legacy virus mm-hmm. and Moira McTaggart uh, is just roaming around his old bedroom and just imagining like all it's like doing all these things like painting like playing the guitar and 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 doing all sorts of activities in 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 this bedroom and that was me as an only child like i kept myself busy like alone in my bedroom just doing all sorts of things creative things and i was like yeah like i i I totally get this guy and and even like these moments where like he feels sad and depressed it's like I get it. Like I stay busy to, to, to run away from, from feeling depressed. Like that's, uh, that's how, that's how I understood the character, but, but I also. Oh, that's interesting. Up, uh, yeah. I, I yeah, also dressed up as a, uh, as multiple man for Halloween where I, I, uh, I made these, these, uh, these cutouts, these life-size cutouts of myself. Full color cut of myself dressed in a man uh, tights, and uh, yeah, and, and they, were, they were strapped to my back, they were, they were glued on for peacock wing spreads uh, behind my back. And I was like, the party just walking around, and like people would, you know, take second looks at like, like uh, double takes at me because they would think, wait, like. There's actually three of you. Because they're like, <laughs> they're like high res photos of me. Uh, <laughs> and you have to stop and explain who Multiple Man is. And, and, and yeah. well, I, I, I dressed up in, 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 a, in a, a, at the Silver Snail organized Halloween party. So they all. Oh, they, they would have known. Yeah, half of yeah. them knew who I was. It's the worst. Uh, I went to, uh, I think it was Halloween last year. I went as, uh, do you see the movie Us, the Jordan Peele movie? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So I went as the tethered version of myself. I had like a red jumpsuit and the one brown glove and the golden scissors. And I did the eyes and, oh, and uh, I had to explain who I was about eight. <laughs> I'm, like, oh, geez. I'm like, you guys got to watch more movies. I'm like, come on. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, with, with, yeah, with, with multiple men, I mean, at, at least half of them get it, but the, the other half that don't, they think it's already, it's a cool costume because there's, yeah. there's three of me. Um, and and I won the group co- uh the group contest the the group oh awesome contest. as myself like and 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 this bag of prizes that was meant to be given to like you know a group of five or six people you know <laughs> like that was all for me <laughs> oh that's awesome uh, so I, I, I got all these comics and action figures and, and collectibles uh from the Silver Snail store. Um, and then from there, I, I became friends with other people that dressed up as X Men characters at the party, and and we're like, hey, like we we got this idea to, to become a cosplay charity group. So before the Pitiful Human Lizard, I I dressed up as Multiple Man for 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 charity events. You know, like we we, we would yeah. do cosplay skates. Oh, we would do cosplay skate where we would do a clothing drive for a, a local shelter. Uh, that was lovely. Drive, st- stuff like that. And even we, we would be invited to uh, to uh, movie theaters to promote Marvel films. So especially like movies like X Men, uh, like X Men Apocalypse, Days of Future Past. We were invited uh, to our X-Men characters and, you know, like hype up the crowd at, That's awesome. at screen. And, 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 we, and we got our, our, our free screening at, at the end. That was our, our, uh, your payment. Our, uh, our payment. Yeah. yeah that's, all, that's not too bad. I'll take that. Yeah. So the, the so yeah, multiple man was, was a character that I, I grew a huge attachment to and I, and me being a writer artist like a, a cartoonist i wanted to show my talent adventure it's gonna be a choose your own dupe adventure uh, in a two-page spread and <laughs> so this was something that i did in 
2016, 2017. Uh, and I did for the internet. I, I did for the Twitters uh, <laughs> just to get the likes and retweets. And, you know, like I, I had friends like Chip and, and Ryan North, like retweeted and, and mm -hmm. which, which got some attention from like Brian Bendis and stuff like that. But it didn't go anywhere until 20. 21 last year a friend of mine love comic sample that he he my, my friend brian mclaughlin who's uh, an, another toronto cartoonist who's done stuff for owl magazine he he uh he tweeted out my uh my my comic page again my comic sample from 2017 he was like i and he 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 just showed a a, a a second wave of, uh, of appreciation for this, which got the attention of Dan Slott. Mm. And then uh, Tom Brevoort, the senior VP of Marvel, yeah. finally saw it. And he was like, like, I, I don't know how we're going to do this, but I got to have this in one of our books. And that's when he reached out to me from, from that, from that tweet. Mm. And, and he, and it was funny because he uh, had a hard time trying to get a hold of me. Uh, so like, he even had to like ask Chip for my contact email, even though like I, I, I was, me and Tom were DMing back and forth, yeah. but uh, it was through Chip that he got my contact information and that's where he connected with, he connected me with a bunch of editors because he was like, Okay, not only do we want you to do to do that multiple man comic for one of our books, but we want you to do the same thing that you just did with that multiple man script, but do that for Fantastic Four. Mm. Uh, and and also, I also got to uh, work on a Jubilee story for Marvel Voices, mm -hmm. so that was like my first few months. I was like working back to back. Oh, wow. uh, my favorite characters i was working on like yeah my, my favorite characters multiple man ben grim thing and jubilee jubilee is my my my, my second favorite marvel character of all time actually. really wow. uh, i was gonna say my, my second favorite x-men character but it's my second favorite marvel character oh that's amazing i don't hear the her come up as often as when it comes to favorite marvel characters yeah that's so awesome. yeah uh well, I mean, I think one of the reasons was mainly because like she, she's an Asian superhero who doesn't uh, she doesn't have she doesn't carry that that you know the, the Asian stereotype of yeah being a martial she doesn't artist. have a samurai sword or something yeah I know what you nothing mean. like that yeah, yeah, no, yeah. And, and, and and especially like me being Asian but born in north america um like I, I i totally related to to someone who is asian but assimilated to being north american like jubilee and and, and like yeah so seeing her on 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 tv like that's how i connected with her uh so yeah. you're it's like it's the representation which uh kind of connected with you that's exactly awesome. And yeah. I'm, I had a long conversation with a previous guest about that, how important it is. I think it might have been Marco Rudy, but it was about um, that sort of stuff about the representation and, and how important it is. Um, so you must have been over the moon to see uh, like Shang Chi and the and the, having a Canadian born uh, Asian person playing him. Yeah, very. Um, yeah, yeah it, it, was, it was it was it was awesome because the thing is, I, I was also a huge convenience fan i saw the strip you did that, that combined the pitiful lizard with uh, the convenience simu uh, like be announced at san diego comic-con for mm. shang chi and then star as shang chi uh like that's that's i, I, I was like I, like like just i was really excited just yeah just, just it was an really amazing more. movie i yeah i did see the uh you did a kim's convenience little strip crossover with pitiful lizard right I did. Yeah, yeah, I remember I saw that, and I, I thought that was uh, obviously you must have had a connection there. So I, I figured you were probably a fan. Uh, that, that's, that's how I I I uh, interacted and became social media friends with Paulson Young Lee, mm -hmm. uh, who who plays Appa. Yeah, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so he's now, now in the Star Wars universe. He's now in the Star Wars universe. <laughs> yeah, which is pretty awesome. Every time he pops up on uh, Mandalorian, I'm like, yeah. Ooh, you know. <laughs> I, I, I made a custom action figure of this character, Carson Tava, during the pandemic. And uh, yeah, I got to visit his house and, 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 and you know, give him his action figure. Oh, that's made, so cool. I, I made two of them, like one for myself and one for him. And, you know, like each head sculpt had a slightly different demeanor. Mm-hmm. Uh, like what one was like neutral and one was like a bit more serious. And that's and awesome. I asked him, like, which one do you like best? He's like, you, you decide, you decide. And like, <laughs> well, um, I, I'm going to go give you the, the one that, that, uh, made the news on social media because, uh, yeah. Cause, cause when, uh, and then I think, yeah, CBC like covered it. And, That's and awesome. <laughs> wow. Blog TO and, and, and all sorts. And uh, yeah, so, so yeah, it, it was a big hit like throughout. I, I think I gained a lot of followers because of the Carson Table action figure more than, more than my comic work. Whatever works. Uh, What's coming down the pipeline? Um, so I finished. I finished. Uh, I've been doing a lot of stuff for Marvel Unlimited. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I I got to do a lot of stuff for uh, Multiple Man. I, I got to write and draw about six issues of Multiple Man and Strong Guy. Uh, two arcs, six issues, in X Men Unlimited. They're they're available now. Uh, yeah, I, I I wrapped up. Um, like. Two months ago, I wrapped up this uh, this series, which which is now available, called X Friends, which is uh, great title. Yeah, bring <laughs> multi man and strong guy out in space with the Star Jammers, Gladiator, a bunch of other cameos. This sounds amazing. Yeah, I got I got to work with like the, the Marvel social media team. Uh, so so it, it, yeah it got it got featured on marvel.com and, and the marvel tiktok uh so yeah go check that out i i, I wrapped up another thing uh, for marvel Un- unlimited but i'm not gonna say um i'm just gonna say that it's gonna come out in february okay uh and and i got to draw a lot of fan favorite characters oh cool that i, that I got to like pick because because I, 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 I got to write and draw and color it and even did some lettering in it as well. Oh, really? Uh, you don't see that as much uh, with with uh, with creators. It seems like mostly it's just digital, but it's cool you get to do lettering as well. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, y- you'll see it uh, when it comes out. Like you'll you'll see why it uh, it's unique to to have my my handwriting in, in, in that lettering. Um, okay. Yeah, cool. I'm excited. But but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just say I got to draw Captain America for the first time, and I got to draw. Uh, who else can I say? Mm, yeah, I'll say uh, Bucky. But that's oh. about it. Like there, there's a, a a dozen characters I I got to draw. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome, man. That's, yeah. that's huge. I'm I'm so excited for you. That's that's amazing. Um, yeah, and and I have to make sure to thank Dad David for making the uh, making the. The connection between us uh david i don't know if dave told you our connection he uh we when he went to school uh called university me and him worked at a convenience store together in Anaganish. no and, way uh, yeah and he was my roommate for a little while in truro where i live now um well he was between things so uh yeah no it's great he's been on the uh, on the show before and i've had him we've had him on the x-men show several times as well oh, which okay. uh i know you're excited you mentioned you'd like to be on sometime Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh-huh. my uh, my my co-host Davin is uh, is very keen on that. Um, he's he, he's going to give me a list to send you of all the episodes in the next season we're doing. So, oh, wicked! Yeah, I can't wait. I can't. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, um, because the Disney changed the numbering. I remember we talked about the 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 multiple man episode, but we already did it because it was uh, old comfort. Disney had changed the um the the numbering back to the original what it should have been, so it actually happened in earlier in season three instead of like when they posted it the first time around. So yeah, and sadly we got through that one already. But but unfortunately, Multiple Man doesn't have a lot to do in it. He just kind of no. like <laughs> Wolverine just fights him a little yeah, bit. Yeah, a few lines. Fun. It's funny that there's like all these threads in that show. They don't they they pull on, but don't like we just did the episode where um 
uh, Cyclops uh, meets realizes Corsair is his father. And, uh, you know, they never, they, they, they mentioned that he has a brother. We see the brother. They never meant, even when they meet in the X Factor episode, they never reference their brothers. They do subtly, but their powers don't work on each other, uh, yeah. which is like a little, a little reference, but it's like they never go back to fill that in. Hopefully the, the new series will do that. Did you just say, until we meet again? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I love it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> until we meet again in our family dinner. <laughs> <laughs> see you at Christmas. Yeah. yeah it's pretty great. Oh, well, thank you so much for being on the show, uh, Jason. It's been a real honor to be able to talk to you. Oh, thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. Well, Pleasure. I'll, well, I'll be in touch about the X-Men show, and uh, and we'll talk to you then. Well, thanks for having me. Have a good oh. night. Thanks again, Jason. Have a good one. There it is, my talk with Jason Liu. Uh, great little conversation. I uh, I learned a lot from him, a lot about uh, the only child experience, the, the being the child of immigrants experience. Um, the, the His dad pushed him to be a doctor. is kind of the stereotypical Asian parent thing, but I thought that was uh, pretty insightful and also uplifting that his father sort of acquiesced and accepted his son's interest in art when it became apparent that the son wasn't going to change his mind. I thought that was really nice and touching. And uh, yeah, just in general, I, I thought Jason was a very engaging talk and also someone who uh, who was, uh, you know, really open about his, his journey and his, his emotions, his experiences. And there's some stuff in there that I was surprised about, about like the the keeping busy as an only child to kind of stave off depression or loneliness. And, and that's something I think a lot of people can probably relate to and maybe not from being an only child, but just, you know, being a person, that uh, a human, a flawed human like the rest of us. Uh, trying to make their way in this wackaday world. But uh, great conversation. Very excited to have and bring it to you. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, on a side note, I just want to say, you know, obviously I told you my story about our, our, our cat at the end of the episode. So my homework for you <laughs> is to, uh, to hug your pet. Um, if you have a pet at home, a cat, a dog, a bird, a snake, whatever, just hug your pet tonight and... Uh, you know, remember how important they are to you and to your life because they are, and uh, you certainly will notice their absence when they're gone. Uh, I don't have a guest picked out for the next episode yet. I have several several great uh, options, and uh, once I get the, one of them to, uh, to commit to the sit-down, I will advertise it on social media as well. But there's some really cool people down the pipeline, and I'm excited for you guys to be able to hear that as well. And, uh, yeah, we are a proud member of the United Federation of Podcasts here at the Graphic Histories Podcast. They have a bevy of interesting and exciting podcasts, including the sister podcast of this show, uh, X-Rated, the X-Men Animated Review Show, which Davin Scalhorn and I watch every episode of the old Fox X-Men show and uh, review them. It's a fun time. Me and Davin have a lot of witty banter, and by that I mean we just argue about things. But it's a, it's a ton of fun and uh, a great show, especially if you enjoyed that, that show. We do a real deep dive. We have some great guests as well. We had uh, recently Brooks Wachtel, who's a writer on the show. We have uh, we had Lenore Zan, who's the voice of Rogue. We had Rick Hoberg, who's an animator for the show. We had the Leewalds, who were the showrunners for, very, for the entire entirety of the show. And uh, we have some other cool ones coming down the pipe as well over there. So make sure to check that one out as well, wherever you get your podcasts. And I will see you back here in two weeks. In the meantime, stay safe. Have fun, and don't do anything I wouldn't do. Which, you know, means you're pretty wide open. <laughs>